So welcome to Grand Rounds, June 2023. Today we have Dr. Liz Ballard talking to us about orthotics and who needs support. Dr. Ballard earned her doctor of physical therapy degree from the Murphy Deming College of Health Sciences at Mary Baldwin University and a Bachelor of Science degree in athletic training from Western Carolina University. She completed her residency training at St. Luke's University Health Network's orthopedic physical therapy residency, and she's board certified in orthopedic physical therapy and serves as the program manager for foot and ankle care at physical therapy at St. Luke's. Dr. Ballard enjoys mentoring and teaching specialty areas of practice such as gait evaluation, ortho orthotic prescription, and management of foot and ankle pathologies in the St. Luke's University Health Network uh, Orthopedic Physical Therapy Residency. Dr. Ballard is adjunct faculty member at, in the Department of Biology and a guest lecturer in the Master of Science in Athletic Training Program and the Doctor of Athletic Training Programs at Moravian University. She also serves in, uh, as the rehabilitation coordinator for Moravian University. Please make sure that you log in using EADS, either with the uh, code, the activity sign in code, which is on this front screen and also in the chat, or using the QR scan code, which is on the screen or in the chat. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me and make sure to make to get CE credit, you must complete the quiz at the end and the course evaluation at the end. Again, if you have any questions or any issues, please let me know. And if you're watching the recorded version, you're already in it, so that's fantastic. And then all you need to do is complete all the EADS requirements and then you're good. Without further ado, I will turn it over to All right, thanks, Steve. This is the activity description for today and the designation statement for St. Luke's. I have nothing to disclose. And here are the learning objectives. Um, so today, as Steve introduced, we're going to talk about custom orthotics uh, and orthotic use in general. And you know, some of the knowledge gaps that were listed on that previous activity slide are really understanding the difference between truly what a custom orthotic is, a semi-custom device, an off-the-shelf uh, device. And there's some new emerging literature to talk about technology and how we prescribe these types of orthotics. So, um, and across the professions, we often describe different jargon and different uh, modifications in different ways. Uh, so the goals of this lecture is to take all that information and walk away with a basic understanding of different rigidities of different terminology and basic gait analysis and how this can apply to custom orthotics. So what does the evidence say about orthotics? Um, we know that evidence is mixed regarding custom versus semi-custom orthotics. That's clearly reported in the literature. Um, both devices, whether that's custom or semi-custom, have been found to be effective at reducing eversion velocity and knee excursion, things that we know do contribute to injury. Um, just from a terminology standpoint so that you understand the difference between those, a true um, custom device is truly custom to each person's foot, to their foot contours, whereas a semi-custom device is not. Um, and I often have patients come back to me in the clinic and they say, uh, and they bring me an orthotic device that is more of a semi-custom device. Um, and a provider actually scanned their foot and based on the heel width based on the size of their shoe or their arch height, someone in a lab pulled a semi-custom device off of a shelf and added some modifications to that. That is not a custom device. That is a semi-custom device. Um, and then off the shelf are truly what they're described as is off the shelf. When you go to your local store and you pull something off the shelf, that's usually a small, medium, or large uh, based on your shoe type. What we know about custom orthotics, though, is that custom orthotics can change foot pressure in stance and during gait. In both the pes planus, those really flat feet, and the pes cavus, those hard, high arched people. Um, and oftentimes, from a gait analysis standpoint and from an injury pathology standpoint, we talk about those pes planus individuals as being the bigger culprits for injury. Um, and that you're just not going to see the pes cavus as often. And that's because those only make up 10% of the population. But those people with a truly high arch and cavus feet um, also end up with specific foot pressure and injuries as well. Um, we also know that custom orthotics 
including both intrinsic or extrinsic uh, posting can further de decrease ankle inversion, eversion, knee valgus, knee external rotation, and vertical loading during gait. And we definitely know from a gait standpoint that increased vertical displacement, increased vertical loading has a direct correlation to injury. Um, and evidence is clear that regarding orthotic usage, we can decrease impact on that lower extremity and we can decrease foot pressure and correct foot pressure. However, that has not been clearly correlated as actually preventing injury. So future research needs to be done to correlate those factors. Throughout this uh, presentation, I'm going to talk a lot about foot posture and how that results to um, prescription of a custom orthotic device and how foot posture influences injury. Uh, one scale that I, I often use in terms of identifying foot posture is the foot posture index. Um, so if you're not familiar with this tool, spend some time researching it afterwards. I could do a whole talk on foot posture index alone, but that's not why we're here today. Uh, so foot posture index has great measures behind it from a validity standpoint. Um, for those of you who were educated like me in school, I initially learned how to take um, goniometric measurements of the rear foot, forefoot, and actually measure valgus and varus. Um, but we know from a validity standpoint that those measures are not very accurate. Um, Interrater and intraverator are not, not great tools uh, in terms of measuring that. However, foot posture index has excellent measures behind it, and it's easy to repeat. Uh, it looks at six specific anatomical landmarks, and those anatomical landmarks of the rear foot, the midfoot, and the forefoot are utilized to classify foot type. And foot posture index has been found to predict injury in runners and both ends of the spectrum. So those highly pronated individuals as well as the highly supinated individuals. Um, and we know that people who fall somewhere in the middle of those neutral feet are less likely to sustain an injury. Evidence also suggests that lowering foot posture scores on the foot posture index, especially in those people who are at the high end of the spectrum of the pronated individuals, decreases a risk of injury. Therefore, one might surmise that if orthotics also alter foot posture scores, they should also decrease a risk of injury. However, more research needs to be done on this. And moving into clinical experience next. So evidence-based practice, like we always talk about, is more than just the evidence itself. Um, but in orthotic prescription, we should also talk about clinical experience. Um, from a clinical experience standpoint, the following pathologies often respond really well to orthotic in intervention. So the medial tibial stress syndromes are often as a result of altered gait mechanics. So in those extremely pes planus individuals who are really collapsing in, putting that person in a custom orthotic and helping to offload the medial aspect of their lower leg can significantly um, impact their, their injury pathology and help them return to function. Stress reactions from a foot and ankle standpoint, a stress reaction or a stress fracture can also have um, custom builds into an orthotic to offload those areas. So for example, if a patient had a fifth met stress fracture, I could actually build in a cutout to specifically offload that fifth metatarsal. Or say a, a distance runner has a calcaneal stress reaction, I could build in some padding to help offload that calcaneus and keep them active and keep them moving um, in, in their functional activity. Again, the pes planus foot is oftentimes the one that we put in an orthotic to try and offload some of those foot pressures. And there's a lot that can be done from a toe deformity standpoint. Um, again, you could spend a whole lecture just talking on accommodations that could be made for toe deformities. Um, from a hallux valgus standpoint, again, you can build out custom cutouts to help offload that first MTP uh, where the first MTP is collapsing into valgus and allow for more space in the person's shoe. With a turf toe injury or plantar plate injury, you can build in rigidity into the orthotic with a turf toe plate to help with propulsion. Same thing from a hallux rigidus standpoint, you may want to build in some um, plating or potentially some forefoot posting to help with this person with propulsion moving forward. And metatarsalgia and Morton's neuromas are one of those few pathologies that I'll say um, benefit from just doing an orthotic alone. These people do really well with building a custom orthotic and placing a pad just proximal to their metatarsals to help offload their painful met heads or to help offload a neuroma. 
plantar fasciitis, again, you could build in some some custom things to either pad the heel at that origin of that plantar fascia and offload uh, that painful heel, or you can also create a cutout for the tension along the plantar fascia itself to allow for a little bit more space and less pressure on that tense plantar fascia. Um, and then from a patellofemoral and a hip and an IT band standpoint, with these pathologies, we're often attributing issues with gait um, in terms of causing the pathology himself. So whether that be an extremely pes planus individual with excessive pronation or a extremely cavus individual who never pronates and is constantly loading the IT band and the lateral aspect of the knee, uh, putting that person into a custom orthotic and using some posting to control their gait cycle can significantly impact uh, their overall recovery. And we've talked a lot about evidence-based practice and just clinical experience of, of myself and other providers um, and what types of pathologies respond well to custom orthotics. Uh, but I always tell providers um, as they're referring for orthotics or prescribing for orthotics themselves that orthotics should be as much evidence-based practice as everything else that you do. Rarely, um, is an orthotic the only intervention needed? Those are very rare cases. But if you're treating someone with patellofemoral pain or a hip impingement or even a foot pathology, there are likely other things that need to be addressed in the treatment plan. So for example, the patient with plantar fasciitis likely needs a towel stretch seen here, maybe needs some intrinsic activation, or maybe some joint mobilization, mobilizations to address joint mobility restrictions, or the patellofemoral pain patient who has a glute weakness, uh, in addition to controlling their excessive pronation or abnormal gait mechanics, they may also benefit from other areas of practice. So don't get honed in. Well, I'm excited to talk about orthotics today and hope that you guys leave excited to talk about orthotics. Um, don't hone in and think that orthotics are the only piece that your patient needs. From an evaluation and prescription standpoint, this evaluation does look a little bit different um, than other evaluations you might complete. So really important, obviously, in this patient to look at their foot posture and their foot type as that's going to go into your prescription process. Um, looking at what they look like in stance, as well as their walking gait assessment, and if they're a runner, their functional ability to run. Um, mobility assessments also key with these patients. Uh, someone who has a super rigid foot can't necessarily be posted back into a neutral position versus that person who has a super flexible foot um, might tolerate a little bit more posting and they might tolerate a little bit more rigidity to the device. And noting any deformities that you see is also super important um, from offloading in a custom orthotic device. Uh, so for example, a common deformity that I see in patients is a Morton's toe where their second toe is longer than the other. And in many of those cases, their second metatarsal is actually longer than their first metatarsal. And that leads to toe injuries that often leads to damage of a tendon in the toe and clawing or hammer toes. Um, it also can lead to increased callusing and wear over that second med head, which ultimately will be painful for the patient. And you could easily build in a cutout for this person for that second metatarsal and offload that to help prevent changes in their foot pressure and other injuries down the road. Um, so deformities in general are super important to note, even something as simple as just a small callus. Activity level is also important. You know, knowing what type of activity this patient wants to get back to doing with this orthotic helps you to describe um, what type of device they need. Uh, so whether this is the distance runner who needs to put this in their training shoe, um, the construction worker who needs to put it in their construction boot, um, or potentially a golfer or a business person who wants to put something low profile in their dress shoe, or even maybe the 85-year-old little lady who says, I just want to be able to stand for 10 minutes with my fallen arches at the kitchen sink um, and have comfort so that I can do the dishes or I can cook in front of the stove for my family. Um, so knowing activity level also helps you prescribe the rigidity of the device and the potential accommodations they might have and how bulky to make this device and how controlled you can do that, whether that's low profile or a thicker device. And again, knowing what kind of shoe you're going to put it in is really important. So again, are you putting this in a dress shoe? Are you putting this in a sneaker? Are you putting this in a cleat? What type of shoe is super important? And then ultimately, you're going to scan the foot next. Um, and that portion, the actual scan of the foot, probably only takes me about 30 seconds to do each foot. So we're going to talk a little bit 
next about scanning and what does the evidence say for scanning versus molding versus impressions. Um, practice is definitely moving towards scanning the foot with an iPad utilizing a laser scanner that's attached to the iPad. Um, and I want to drive home the point that clinician training drives accuracy with all three of these. So your clinician training in molding and doing a foam impression tray in scanning and using technology definitely impacts the accuracy of this evaluation and of the mold that's being made. Um, so for myself, who's almost exclusively practiced with the iPad and the scanner, I'm much better at doing that than I am in doing the plaster molds or than I am in doing the foam impression trays. However, the caveat to that is the pet orthotist who was or the provider who was trained 20 years ago and has only ever made plaster molds is going to probably be better and more accurate at molding and maintaining subtalar neutral as they do that than they are with using the new technology. Um, what we do know from an evidence standpoint is that both the plaster and the scanning methods are more accurate in comparison to impression trace or weight bearing assessments. So anytime you're taking a weight bearing assessment, putting the foot down into foam, putting your foot on top of a scanner and standing on that, that allows for splaying of the foot, that allows for compensation. Again, if there's a pathology, a patient may, might weight shift off of that area of pain and change their foot posture. So putting a patient in a non-weight bearing position and in a sub neutral position non-weight bearing is the most ideal way to get a scan or to do the plaster mold. We also know that 3D scanning results do result in an increased accuracy and validity of measuring a patient for custom orthotics. And scanning also results in increased speed of lab time of production and delivery of these back to your patient. Um, so when you talk about access to care uh, and what a patient needs in terms of care, um, if you look at the two of those options, when I scan a patient in the office, Usually before that patient ever walks out the door, the lab has called me and has received the email of the scan and has received a copy of my prescription form and we can consult immediately about the device that I want to prescribe versus if I was making a foam impression or if I was doing the plaster mold, I would have to wait potentially if I'm lucky that day for FedEx, UPS, um, Postal Service to pick the device up, get it shipped out the following day probably arrive to the lab by the end of the week and then not go into production until a week later. So this definitely increases um, access to care and to the devices that patients need. Next, we're gonna talk a little bit about the different types of orthotics. So the rigid orthotic, this is that hard plastic device. Um, I almost never, and I say almost, I won't say never, I almost never prescribe this device. The rigid device provides ex excellent control. So this device is going to provide control of the foot. What position you put the foot in, in this device, it will likely stay in. However, we know that the foot needs adaptability when you walk. So while this might control that extremely pes planus individual, it doesn't allow for adaptability. And some level of pronation has to occur during the gait cycle to have normal mechanics. And this device doesn't allow for very much of that. Um, so patients often don't like them. They're really hard in their shoes. They're hard to break in. Compliance isn't great, and it doesn't allow for that that adaptability especially shock absorption um, with higher level activity if someone's running jumping in this device there is no shock absorption and it definitely increases impact uh, to that lower extremity so what majority of people prescribe these days or refer for are truly a semi-rigid device um, and this device allows for adequate control and can allow for all the modifications that i mentioned earlier but it also allows for some shock absorption. It also allows for adaptability of that foot throughout the gait cycle and throughout function, whether that's jumping, running, um, descending stairs, um, whatever functional activity this patient wants to get back to doing. The semi-rigid device works for a majority of patients. And then the accommodative devices, again, I rarely utilize this device. This 
provides an excellent source of cushion. However, it provides little to no control. Um, this works well for patients who have a diabetic neuropathy, um, a patient who you might be worried about getting a sore, um, but they need a little bit of control. You can create a custom device with a deepened heel cup that contours their foot and provides a little bit of arch support, but also cushioning so that you don't have to worry about sores as they break this device in. You don't have to worry about um, other injuries to the foot, but this is going to be that cushioned walking on a cloud type feeling. It is not going to provide any control. Right. And there are a multitude of accommodations. I, I don't expect you guys to walk away from this talk today and know every accommodation out there that can be made from an orthotic standpoint, um, but there are a multitude of things that can happen um, in terms of prescription process to help control a patient with an orthotic. Um, the most common being posting, whether that's intrinsic or extrinsic, um, posting the rear foot to help control that rear foot position. Um, so posting to control for excessive pronation, most likely. Um, Again, I would rarely, rarely, rarely post um, someone who's an excessive supinator because forcing somebody into pronation is rarely a good thing. Um, but occasionally those patients do exist that you need to post that way. Um, but there's a lot that you can do in terms of cutouts and padding um, throughout the orthotic device to really offload certain areas of pain. And shoes, we're gonna talk a little bit about shoes next. So shoes are also super important for the device. So just prescribing the orthotic device is one piece. Knowing the shoe wear that the orthotic's going to go into is another piece and how compliant uh, the patient's going to be uh, with breaking in this device and wearing the shoe that you want them to wear with this device. The best controlling semi-rigid devices that I make fit best in a sneaker. However, if I have a teenage patient who comes back to me and says, I only want to wear Converse's or Vans to school, making them something that fits in a bulky sneaker isn't going to be beneficial for them. Or educating this patient that, hey, I can make you something that fits in the van or in the Converse, but it's not going to give you as much control as the device that fits in your sneaker, and seeing if mom and dad are willing to, to buy two different pairs. Um, what I would make for a men's dress shoe would be different than what I would make for a sneaker. Again, that would need to be something a little bit more pro low profile. And believe it or not, looking at the top left there, there are devices that can be made for women's high heels. They provide very little control, um, but for that extremely pes planus individual who needs just a little bit more arch support, or maybe you want to throw some of the weight back onto the heel, you can um, make a orthotic device for a heel. And they can go up to about the toe crest length, so you could potentially potentially even build in a little bit of padding to offload their med heads um, when they're in heels. Um, so for somebody who wears heels to work every day and says that they can't change that, you might make a, bit, a little bit of a difference for that patient with a, a custom orthotic. Um, and then again, knowing the activity level that the patient's going to do. Um, so for the soccer athlete, what I would make for a cleat would be very different than what I would make for the trainer shoe for, um, for a distance athlete. And then I think one of my favorite cases that I've ever made of a custom orthotic would be the top right image here. Um, a few years back, I was treating an Irish step dancer and she had a severe case of bilateral plantar fasciitis and was referred to me for, for treatment as well as uh, for a custom orthotic device. And I actually had to ship her shoes off to the lab and they built the device um, into her shoe. We also took volumetric measurements of her foot to make sure that with the device in her shoe, her foot would also fit in the shoe prior to it coming back to me. Um, but I was able to actually build into this device in her Irish step dancing shoe um, some additional padding to offload the origin of her plantar fascia where she was having a lot of pain and a cutout specifically along the area um, where her plantar fascia was taught. And the cool thing with the scanning is you can actually mark that on the patients. You could draw on the patient right along that tight plantar fascia and they build that cut out exactly where the patient is having pain or where that tension is. So a little bit more on shoes. Um, one of the most important things from shoe wear standpoint is making sure the shoe fits. If the shoe does not fit, nothing else matters. So you can design an excellent orthotic, but if they try to shove that orthotic in a shoe that's too small, 
they are likely still going to have issues. Or on the opposite end of the spectrum, if they're in a shoe that's too big, it's not going to control them the way that they should. Um, and knowing that every shoe is different. Every brand out there has a slight difference in terms of size. What might be an eight in one shoe might be a seven in another, a seven and a half in another shoe. So going somewhere where the salesman is good at fitting your shoes is important. Um, and having patients, once they get their orthotics, take their orthotics with them to be fitted for a shoe. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about the shoe components here next and why that's so important that as they're fitting um, the shoe, uh, sorry, lost uh, the image here for a second. I have, <laughs> um, but so as they're fitting the shoe, um, they can make sure the device fits in it. And oftentimes patients actually have to go up a half size or so um, once they get the orthotic because the orthotic is thicker than the insert that's in the shoe itself. So knowing that when you're educating your patients and they get their custom orthotics is really important. And at the end of this lecture, I don't expect anyone to be a shoe expert, but we're going to break down the shoe a little bit just so you have a basic understanding of what to look at from a shoe component standpoint. Um, so the heel counter is the rear portion of the shoe. So that's the most important portion in terms of controlling the rear foot. If you have a patient that's an early excessive pronator, and by an early excessive pronator, for those of you who maybe don't remember this um, back from your gait analysis days, this is the person that as soon as they strike the ground, their heel is collapsed into excessive pronation. Um, so remember, there should be some supination when you initially strike the ground. And this person, as soon as they strike, they're collapsing into an excessive amount of pronation. Putting this person into a rigid heel counter that controls for that can make a huge difference. Um, the outside lasting helps in terms of rigidity of the foot. So depending on what that is styled as determines how rigid the foot is. The inside is how the inside is constructed. And again, the way that the inside lasting is stitched uh, contributes to the rigidity of the shoe itself. Um, you can also have posting within the shoe itself, and we're going to see some images of that in the next slide, but there can actually be built in some intrinsic posting or extrinsic posting with plastic on the side of the shoe itself to help control for that excessive amount of pronation. So again, looking for a shoe that might have rear foot post posting could work really well for that excessive, early excessive pronator. And then the midsole is important for control during mid stance. Um, so looking for the plastic piece along the midsole or along uh, the guide rails along the midsole helps to control for those patients who are excessive mid stance pronators. For those people who are the excessive mid stance pronators, they look good um, throughout the gait cycle until they hit mid stance, then they have an excessive amount of pronation. Putting them in a shoe with that guide rail or with that good midsole is often all they need. Oftentimes these patients don't need a custom orthotic. So starting with some of these shoe modifications first might work really well for some of these patients. Um, and then the heel flare also contributes to uh, control of the rear foot as well. And then the toe box is really important for lots of pathologies. Um, we really should uh, never force our toes into super tight pointy shoes and Steve's smiling here as I'm standing in a pair of heels uh, presenting, um, but our feet were made display, our toes were made display, and those met heads were made display. So very rarely can a patient tolerate peeing in that type of shoe. So educating patients with toe pathologies, with metatarsal path pathologies, being in a wide toe box that allows that splaying makes a big difference for those pet patients. And I wanted to throw this slide in just to talk a little bit more about the hill counter. Don't worry, we're not going to divide out any of that other content in any more detail, but I want to talk about the heel counter as it res um, relates to custom orthotics as well. So the heel counter, like I said, is really important for rear foot control. Um, and for that patient who's an early excessive pronator, you may want to start by putting this patient in a motion control shoe. If you look at the bottom two images here, so the one on the left is a Brooks shoe, the one on the right is a New Balance, you can notice some of that intrinsic posting, you can see that the medial aspect of that shoe is built up more, and that's what controls for the excessive amount of pronation. And it actually looks as though they've almost taken a chunk off the lateral aspect of the heel. And what that does is that promotes for supination at heel strike. And over the last five years, I have seen this change in lots of motion control shoes. And for the patient who's being fitted for a custom orthotic, 
if you post that person back to neutral, who's an excessive pronator, or maybe you even try to overcorrect them a little bit and you put them into the shoe, you are going to cause another injury. That is going to cause excessive loading of the lateral aspect of their foot. They're going to load their fifth mat and they're going to come back to you in pain. So knowing that almost all custom orthotics need to go in a neutral position because if you've done your job, you've actually put them back into a neutral position and offloaded um, the areas that needed to be offloaded um, with their excessive pronation or excessive supination. All right, so we're going to take all that information now and we're going to put it all together in a couple cases. All right, so I have a, a hip slash SI case, a patellofemoral case, a knee case, um, and two foot and ankle cases of patients that I think you will probably see pretty frequently in the clinic and talk about how, in addition to all the other things that you're doing for treatment, this type of patient presentation might benefit from a custom orthotic as well. So this first case is someone that I'm sure most of you all in the orthopedic world can relate to. Um, this is a patient with a history of chronic SI dysfunction. Um, this is the person who comes in and says, I've had SI pain for 10 plus years. I've done four or five bouts of formal PT. I've done all the right things. I've done the core strengthening, the glute strengthening. I've worked on the lumbopelvic mobility. I'm well educated on how to self-correct. I know how to do it. Um, um, when things fell off, I can self-correct and fix things. Um, I know what sort of uh, aggravating factors to avoid. Um, so, for example, this case is a CrossFitter who does like a th initially did a thousand single leg activities over and over again, and Shocker ended up with SI dysfunction. So they know what activities to avoid. Um, they know how to train from a running standpoint, avoiding crowns on roads and and causing chronic leg length differences. But yet their SI dysfunction has come back yet again with a vengeance. Um, so you're completing a, a very thorough evaluation of this patient. You look at all the things we just talked about, about core strength, glute strength, um, mobility. You're also looking at function. You're looking at how this patient functionally moves. And then you work your way down to the foot and ankle. And you notice something. You notice that one side is fairly pronated and the other side's pretty neutral. Um, and just from an evidence standpoint, when you see about a four degree difference on foot posture index, you should think that this person probably has a leg length difference. And now this can be appear apparent just because of an acute SI dysfunction. So one side appears to be longer and therefore pronates more. However, in this case, you suspect that it's actually a leg length difference. Um, so you measure and you actually confirm um, after follow up um, for uh, radiographic imaging that this patient actually has a centimeter leg length difference. Therefore, you order a custom orthotic to control for their pronation and an added heel lift to offload their leg length difference. And I want to drive home in this case that the heel lift is really the most important thing. And that in these patients, you may even start with a non-custom device. You may start with just a heel lift itself. And as you bring that shorter leg up, and you even out those legs, the other side should actually pronate less. But if you find that that pronation still is not controlled, then that might be the patient who benefits from the custom device with the heel lift built in. So again, the next case is probably a common case that you see all the time in the clinic. Um, but this is the case of the patellofemoral pain, anterior knee pain. Um, this is a 35-year-old male whose chief complaints are anterior knee pain, all of his aggravating factors are what you would expect. Uh, worse with descending stairs, worse with squatting, worse with running. He's completed about four weeks of formal PT at this point. He's had some gradual improvement. Some days are good, some days are not. Um, but he still has difficulty with functional tasks mentioned above. And specifically with the squatting, descending stairs, he has a young child at home, and one of his biggest fears is carrying that child in his arms down the stairs and having his knee give way on him because of pain. Um, when you evaluate his foot posture, you find he is extremely pes planus. Um, so 12, remember, is the end of the spectrum in terms of pes planus. So a 10, 11 is almost as pes planus as it gets. Um, when you look at his functional evaluation, you see an excessive amount of pronation and internal rotation of that lower extremity. You also see um, an excessive amount of valgus collapse. You see that both with the step down and with the squat mechanics. Um, as this patient walks and as you analyze their gait, 
you notice that they're an early accessit pronator. Again, that means that as soon as they're striking the ground, they're accessively pronating. Um, formal PT has done all the right things. They've assessed dorsiflexion range of motion that might be addressed, uh, um, also contributing to his altered uh, squat mechanics. They've addressed glute dysfunction, posterior tip, intrinsic strengthening. However, he's still having these functional deficits despite all the impairments that have been addressed and retraining of function. Um, you've also spent a lot of time retraining his squat mechanics and his functional mechanics, but he's still just not where he needs to be. So this patient was fitted for a custom orthotic with a deepened heel cup. So by deepening the heel cup in that custom device and by adding some rear foot posting to help to control that excessive pronation, this patient day one in their orthotic had immediate improvement in mechanics. Immediately with a step down, with a squat tested, and with gait across the clinic, had significant improvement uh, with all these functional tasks, had almost normalized in terms of mechanics. All right. Next one here is a lateral ankle sprain as we move into the foot and ankle. So I think this is also probably a common occurrence um, in terms of pathologies that you see patients referred with in the clinic. Um, this is a 25-year-old female. She's about eight weeks post-lateral ankle sprain. At this time, her chief complaint is sinus tarsi impingement and lateral column pain. So she's getting pain right along that fifth met and along her cuboid. Um, this type of patient I saw all the time um, from a foot and ankle standpoint, and I'm sure you guys have seen a lot too. And I think early on in my career, I was quick to say, oh, a straightforward ATFL sprain should be easy to rehab, right? I know how to address the joint mobility restrictions. I know how to address the swelling. Um, I know how important balance is to retraining function. Um, I can educate this patient on potential bracing. I'll address all the strength issues. Again, I know how to look for, could there be fibularis involvement in addition to the ATFL itself? But I think I missed in many of those early on cases the cuboid dysfunction that comes with this. So if you think about that inversion ankle mechanism that causes that lateral ankle sprain, there's also a significant load there to the cuboid. And oftentimes the ligament between the calcaneus and the cuboid is disrupted as well. And that leads to chronic instability of the cuboid and chronic dysfunction here. So oftentimes these patients, they're pain improves um, from a ligamentous standpoint. They no longer have pain over the ATFL or over the joint line, but they all of a sudden start having this vague, um, a little bit more distal lateral foot pain along that fifth med head uh, or along the base of the fifth med and along the cuboid. Um, and they might benefit from doing some joint mobilizations, doing a cuboid um, whip or a cuboid mobilization. However, they keep coming back and saying, I need that again, I need that again. These people could benefit from a custom device offloading that cuboid. So for this patient, I built a custom device, again, with that deepened heel cup to control the rear foot. But I also created a cutout for the entire fifth mat that offloaded that cuboid and offloaded that fifth mat to drop it down just a little bit. And that ultimately um, prevented her from having this chronic uh, instability of her cuboid and helped her to normalize function and get back to all the functional activity that she wanted to do. And the last case here is a Morton's neuroma. Um, so this one's a 65-year-old female with chief complaints of pain between her third and fourth interdigital space of the right foot. She's worse with standing, especially in sneakers or a shoe that causes um, compression of her forefoot. From an observational standpoint, given her age, um, you notice some atrophy of her fat pad, leading to increased stress on her med heads here. You notice that she's a cavus foot when she's non-weight bearing. So when she sits on the edge of the table, she's got a nice high arch. However, when she stands, she drops to more of a neutral foot. And then as she's walking, she has an excessive amount of mid-stance pronation. And it's super important to look at all three of those things. So oftentimes from an evaluation standpoint, we just stop at the table evaluation and say, yeah, your met head's hurt. I can palpate that. I did this, the testing. I, I found exactly where that spot of pain is. 
and you start diving into treatment, but without looking at all of these things, you don't really know how she functions and what her foot posture and what her gait is going to look like, especially at this age, as she's likely starting to have a little bit of arch collapse. Um, so prior to treatment and her coming in to see you, she um, read WebMD on Morton's Neuroma, and she went and got fitted for a wide toe box at the local running shoe store. Um, she was with a wider toe box to offload her neuroma. Um, she also saw that she should order a toe spacer, so she ordered some toe spacers from Amazon, um, and she had a little improvement. So walking around in the shoe store, she actually was like, this feels pretty great as she walked up and down the hallway. Um, and the toe spacers did relieve a little bit of pain while she's wearing them, um, but she can't wear them in her shoes. Um, and so she's really had minimal improvement, if any, at this point. Um, day one of treatment, this patient was educated about intrinsic stretching. So she's got this high cavus arch, tight intrinsic. So she was educated on doing some intrinsic stretching um, to avoid aggravating factors uh, of wearing those tight toe box shoes. Um, um, that are going to load that neuroma. Uh, she was also treated with laser to address some of the inflammation, and the clinician added some padding to her over-the-counter insert that the local shoe store also gave her, just proximal to her med heads to help offload those med heads. And I think this is really important from a biomechanical standpoint that you all understand this. This is something you can definitely do in the clinic, um, is take some padding, and if you place that just proximal to the med heads, on a patient's shoe, when they step down, that will cause splaying of their met heads and that will take pressure off of a metatarsalgia, off of a met Morton's neuroma. Patient stood up immediately. First time she had been pain free bothering her. Um, however, when she came back a week later, she was only about 50% better. She said the padding was excellent for about 24 to 48 hours, but then it compressed. And most over-the-counter padding will only last about that long. However, the padding that you build into a custom orthotic has a different density to it, and it lasts much better. So a custom orthotic was ordered for this patient um, with a metatarsal bar to help offload the, that Morton's neuroma. Four weeks later, patient followed up 100% improved. Back to line dancing, that was her functional activity she wanted to get back to doing, running with her grandchildren in the yard and completing pain-free ADLs. And this is that type of patient who does really well with a custom device. Um, I see this patient all the time, and this is the patient who I see one or two visits, and once they break in the device, I never need to see them again. And, and the patient also comes back and says, I really didn't think that that pad was going to make such a difference, but I feel nothing now. This feels great. Um, so these are an excellent case to refer for orthotics. So what's next? I, again, taking away from this lecture today, I hope that you guys all have a basic understanding of what types of pathologies, what type of gait abnormalities, um, a basic understanding of what types of those would benefit from a custom orthotic evaluation and what to do with the orthotic and shoe wear um, as a patient is prescribed those and making some of those recommendations. However, if you're interested in specializing more, um, we have some cool topics coming up. In the future, we have the When the Feet Hit the Ground series. If you're not familiar with this um, talk, this continuing ed event is an excellent gate talk. They also cover orthotics as well. Um, that will be taking place September 9th through 10th. There's still a few open seats and are open outside of the network too, if you know anyone outside of the network who's interested in attending. Um, and then there's going to be an evidence-based uh, orthotics talk in October uh, with myself and a, and a certified pet orthotist, which is, I think, going to be a really cool opportunity to talk a lot about clinical practice as well as what the lab does um, and really tie those two expertises together from a, an evidence-based standpoint. And then ultimately, if you're looking for a specialist, these are all over our locations now. Um, so we have multiple here in Bethlehem and now we're starting um, to work our way out towards Allentown um, and then in some of the northern regions in Broadheadsville or Lehighton. And if you're interested in maybe even starting it in your area, reach out to me and I'll help you get set up. Any questions? Please feel free to type in your question if you have it or unmute yourself and ask. I, I do have a question. Yes. If, uh, if I'm interested in learning more about um, how to custom fit, 
obviously this is something that can just be picked up in, in a day. Like how many cases would you say you need to go through to really get a good functional understanding of the scanner? That's a great question. So of the scanner itself, um, I would say scanning anywhere from maybe 10 to 20 feet, it, but the scanning itself, that's not the hard part. It's the knowing what to do with the prescription. Um, anyone can learn the technology and learn how to make that look nice and smooth, but it's the knowing what to do with it and taking that clinical expertise in your evaluation and saying, I'm now going to add the following things to your device. And again, I would say that maybe treating around 25 cases would be a good number to say, I've seen a wide variety now of pathologies and I feel confident in prescribing um, things a, a prescription across a wide variety of patients. So that's 20 or 25 people and getting the uh, devices back and testing them and seeing what went well, what didn't go well. Yes. Thank you. That's my clinical bias. There's no statistics on that. <laughs> What other questions do you guys have? All right, hearing none. Uh, if you do have any further questions, please feel free to email uh, Dr. Ballard uh, or myself and uh, ask those questions. Again, please make sure you complete the quiz and the course evaluation. And thank you very much for attending.